you everybody for coming out. This is incredible. I really appreciate everyone showing up and it's so encouraging to know that there are people who are interested in science and food uh, who want to spend the evening here. So thank you so much. <coughs> I thought about uh, what I might talk about for this presentation because we've got 20 minutes or so and if you have a geek in your life you know how difficult it is to keep their conversation short and sweet. So rather than try to tell a story, I thought I might just share a bunch of stuff that I think is cool uh, with everybody. So that's going to kind of be the structure is things I think are cool. But first a little bit about me. Um, as Stephanie said, I write the blog Seattle Food Geek. Uh, I've been doing it for about four years, I think. And uh, my the, the thing that kind of uh, made it uh, passing interest to serious interest for me was when I wrote this post on a $75 do-it-yourself sous vide machine design. And we'll talk a little bit more about what sous vide is, but uh, tell your friends, seattlefoodgeek.com. I also am business development manager and PR manager for Modernist Cuisine. We'll talk a little bit more about Modernist Cuisine as well, but I'm going to make some references to it throughout uh, the presentation, and so uh, I work there, and it's super cool. <laughs> this is uh, an egg. This is actually two different eggs. Um, and this egg represents something really important to me. Um, this egg represents a turning point in my life and the way that I felt about food and what I thought food was. Um, uh, I, I've always loved food and my family was really big into food. We ate dinner at the dinner table on a nightly basis, which I didn't realize until later was kind of a bizarre thing. That's um, uh, I took it for granted. Uh, and so I, I've always loved food, and I was into regular cooking, you know, making normal stuff, roast chickens and that kind of thing. And then one day, my wife and I were out for brunch at a restaurant called Tilt in Wallingford. It's a great place. And I had an egg that was different than any other egg I had ever eaten before. And it had this incredible texture, and the yolk was like pudding, and the whites were just this unbelievably light, and it... it, it it was very different from any egg I had ever had before. And so I asked, what's different about this egg? And they told me, whoa, this egg is cooked sous vide. I had never heard of this before. So I did some research um, uh, and, and learned what sous vide cooking is. Now, to sh just to illustrate this, the egg on the right is the egg that's been cooked sous vide. The egg on the left was poached traditionally. This is my uh, do-it-yourself sous vide machine. This is the very first one I ever built. <coughs> and it works like this. In conventional cooking, um, you put your food in an environment that's much hotter than you ever want the food to get to. So if you're cooking an egg, right, there's a, there's a temperature uh, for the yolk where it sets up nicely. And those temperatures are predictable because the proteins inside the yolk um, are very responsible for the temperature. Um, uh, for the texture that the yolk reaches and, it's, and it has a, a very distinct relationship with temperature and time. So if you have control over temperature, you can have control over the texture of your egg yolk. Now, most chefs, um, when they cook an egg yolk, uh, when they poach it, they'll, they'll get the water to where it's about simmering and they'll drop the egg in and they'll spin and then they'll set a timer or a count or uh, you know, recite a limerick or whatever their method is to kind of get their timing right and then they'll pull it out. But really, uh, simmering water can be a lot of different temperatures and the time that you let it sit in is kind of unpredictable and there's lots of other factors. Instead of cooking the egg in a hotter environment, like simmering water, we cook the egg in an environment where the temperature is where we want the egg to get to finally. So uh, in this case, you see it says 50-50. That means that uh, we want the water to be at 50 Celsius, and the water is at 50 Celsius. And that little machine attached to that tub is responsible for doing that. That's its job. It's a water heater with a very sensitive thermometer and a microcontroller that tells the heaters when to turn on and off. And that allows you to set any temperature you like, and it'll stay there very exactly for a very long time. Now that lets you do things like this. The steak on the left is cooked traditionally. The steak on the right is cooked sous vide. Um, rather than cook our steak on a super hot skillet where all of the muscle fibers start contracting from the intense heat and it squeezes out all that moisture and actually flattens down, the steak on the right was cooked in a Ziploc bag um, in water that was, uh, I'm guessing, about 52 Celsius. Um, and it and you leave it in there until the heat has made its way through the meat. And 
It's wonderfully relaxed. It retains all its juices. And then, of course, because you want a nice sear on the outside, you hit it with a blowtorch, which is even more fun than putting it on a skillet. <laughs> Here's another example um, that I think hits home for Pacific Northwesters. The salmon on the left was my very best good faith effort to properly steam a piece of salmon. And it makes me sad, right? This is, that is, it is, even though I tried, it's not beautiful. Um, the salmon on the right is cooked sous vide uh, and is buttery and delicious. So I learned, um, I learned about sous vide cooking and the reason that I decided to build this controller myself was not that I invented the sous vide method. It, it's been around actually since, um, uh, depending on how you count, since the 60s, uh, but certainly since the 1980s. Um, the very first meal that was served sous vide was at a Howard Johnson's in Georgia, I believe, uh, which is sort of a strange place since it's considered kind of a, a, a high-end technique. Um, but sous vide was my gateway drug. Uh, it was, that was the first moment where I looked at food and cooking differently. Um, with sous vide, you start to, uh, it, it challenges traditional cooking. Traditional cooking says you want a seared steak that's medium rare in the middle, you put it on the grill for this long, and then you take it off, and that's how you get medium rare. Sous vide says, wait a second, we have two different goals. We want our steak evenly cooked, and we want a brown crust on the outside. So why don't we achieve those two goals with two different cooking methods? And once you have that revelation, wait a second, I shouldn't be doing things the same way that they did in the 1800s, then all sorts of doors start opening. So here are some um, kind of wacky offshoots of that line of thinking and some of the projects that I have done at home over the last couple of years. This is duck prosciutto, um, and duck prosciutto is delicious, and duck prosciutto has been made for a very long time. Uh, but I made this in my wine fridge at home. I've got one of those little cheapy tabletop kind of wine fridges. It turns out if you want to make duck prosciutto at home, all you need to do is take uh, duck breasts, pack them in salt, and put them in the fridge for 24 hours, wash the salt off, hang them up in a wine fridge, and give them about three weeks or until they've lost about 30% of their moisture. And it is delicious. Uh, and, and it doesn't require particularly expensive equipment, especially if you don't keep your wine fridge full. Um, then from there, I thought, okay, well, I, I want to get into some more temperature stuff. You get, you know, I've got the blowtorch for sous vide. I want the other extreme, liquid nitrogen. Um, I, I, have a, I have a wonderfully supportive wife. She bought me a liquid nitrogen thermos called a doer for Christmas uh, last year so that I could keep it in the house so that I could do things like this. This is an oyster that was shucked using liquid nitrogen. So typically when you shuck an oyster, you've got that kind of dull knife that you slide into the hinge so that you can um, uh, break through this abductor muscle that holds the top of the oyster onto the bottom of the oyster. Well, it turns out that if you dunk these oysters in liquid nitrogen, which is extremely cold, for about uh, 15 seconds, and then you let them thaw at room temperature, that abductor muscle that holds the lid on is kaput, it's broken. And when they thaw to room temperature, the tops just kind of lift right off and you pop them off with your thumbnail, which is super cool. But the even cooler thing, uh, besides not accidentally stabbing yourself in the hand when you're trying to shuck oysters, is you see, you see that beautiful liquid just sitting inside the oyster? That's the liquor, uh, as it's called. That's the, the oyster's natural juice. You don't lose any of it with this method because it's just sitting there and it's wonderful. You can also do things like cryo poaching. Um, cryo poaching is the, the cold version of poaching. This is a cryo poached coconut meringue um, and it's super, super cool. You take coconut milk um, uh, and you can do coconut milk on its own, but you can add other flavorings. And you put it in a whipping siphon, like one of those whipped cream chargers or uh, like a soda siphon kind of thing, uh, to get some gas in it. And then you uh, siphon it out onto a spoon and drop it in liquid nitrogen. Now, traditional poaching, right, heats the food from the outside, and so if you take it out quickly, the, the center will still be cold, but the outside will be warm. Well, cryo poaching is the other way around. We actually freeze the outside of this cream puff, um, but the inside stays liquid, and so when you pop it into your mouth all at one bite, you get dragon's breath, this, this like smoke kind of comes out your nose, and you crunch through the outer shell, but th it's just a very light foam, and it dissolves on your tongue, and it's a really cool sensation. We did this at a, um, a Christmas party for a, a research science lab, uh, and all the scientists loved it. They, they thought it was <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, 
So temperature is one of the sort of spectra that we work across in modernist cooking. And it turns out that pressure is another important uh, spectrum to work across. This is, uh, these are cucumber pickles. Um, these pickles on the right I made in a minute. Um, and I'll show you how it works. It's a technique called um, uh, vacuum compression. So this is a chamber vacuum sealer. It's like a food saver, but instead of having a bag, it's got a chamber. And it pulls a very strong vacuum. This is real time. This is not a time lapse or anything like that. And watch the texture of these cucumbers change. They turn translucent. What's actually happening, and then so it does it some more with, uh, with tomato and a few other things. What's actually going on in here is um, there's air trapped inside of uh, vegetables in, um, uh, in the membranes of their cells. There's some little air bubbles. And when you pull this vacuum, uh, that air expands, and it expands to the point that it actually destroys the cell walls that kind of hold everything together. Now, if you destroy those cell walls while um, the vegetable is submerged in liquid and then you reapply atmospheric pressure, the cell walls get inundated with that liquid. So they actually soak up all of this liquid, which is super cool. So it allows us to do things like this. So these are tomatoes um, that have been vacuum compressed, vacuum compressed with olive oil, and vacuum compressed with olive oil and balsamic vinegar. So you infuse this flavor into the food, but you get this really cool translucent effect. Like most technology, this can also be used for evil. Um, I had this idea really late at night once at a lab dinner. I call it hypermelon, and it's extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, the melon does not actually turn into ninja shapes on its own. I, that was for dramatic effect. But um, that piece of watermelon, that's, I mean, that's, you know, you imagine how big that is. There's no camera tricks here. That small piece can suck up an entire five-hour energy, which you can then consume without tasting five-hour energy. So it's, it's terribly, terribly dangerous. Um, I don't recommend it. Uh, so here's another uh, spectrum, um, gravity. Uh, in a sense. This is a centrifuge. This is actually a centrifuge that I have in my basement at home. Um, it's, I think it got taken off of the original Star Trek Enterprise based on the design. Uh, it's wonderfully retro. So a centrifuge, if you, if you remember from um, uh, you know, school science class, spins things really fast. And as a result, it, it creates centrifugal force, which can separate out liquids by their component density. So all the heavy stuff gets pushed to the outside, and as a result, all the lighter stuff kind of floats up towards the top. So if you have a liquid that's made of multiple things, you can separate those things out using a centrifuge. Okay, we're back. All right. So, um, centrifuges are uh, turn out to be really wonderful tools for culinary applications. Um, this was the first experiment I did when I got my centrifuge, uh, which was I went to a grocery store and I found a bunch of stuff and I put it in the centrifuge to see what would happen. <laughs> so, on the on the left, um, the far most left is. Um, real mayonnaise, the like best foods real mayonnaise, and the one next to it, the other white one, is Miracle Whip. Uh, then there are two varieties of Italian dressing and two varieties of clam chowder, uh, all of which are emulsions. All of these things, uh, th what they have in common is they're emulsions. They're, it's a bunch of stuff that's kind of held together. And I just wanted to see what would happen. Now, I did two other tests with this, uh, Prego and Ragu spaghetti sauce. Um, but one of them exploded in the centrifuge, so I do not have those results. Um, I also, uh, earlier this year, I had the privilege of participating in um, an exhibition in Dublin that kind of looked at food and science in an artistic way. And as part of that, I got to centrifuge as much stuff as I wanted. So I made this wall of centrifuged foods, and these are all different um, raw foods. So there's some lettuces on the top and celery. Um, all the way down to beets and kidney beans and, and all sorts of things that you can see can separate out into interesting layers. One of the most interesting foods, though, um, that, uh, that, that has a centrifugal result, you could say, is peas, um, just regular garden variety peas. If you put peas in a blender 
and then you put that blended pea mixture in the centrifuge, you get out three distinct layers. The first layer that you get is um, pea solids, and it's all the starch from the peas and all this fibrous stuff, and uh, it's not very appetizing because it's so starchy, but you can dehydrate it and turn it into uh, pea flour, um, as I've done here. Then you get two other layers. At the top, you get pea water, which has a terrible marketing problem, but it's really delicious. <laughs> And it's this, it's this vibrant, green, thick, sweet liquid. It turns out that starch is a flavor inhibitor. So when you have starch in foods, you're not tasting them as well as if you didn't. But when we centrifuge our peas, the starch is removed. And as a result, the water that we get tastes sweeter than regular peas do on their own, which is so cool. Then there's this middle layer that we call pea butter. And we call it that because it has the texture of room temperature butter. It's bright green, it's spreadable, and it has the unmistakable flavor of pea. It's like the platonic ideal of a pea flavor. What's cool, though, is now we have access to those components individually, and we can use them individually. So this is a dish that I did where I took the pea flour, rolled it into dough, made ravioli, stuffed with the pea butter, and then served in the pea broth. So this dish is all pea, plus a little bit of flour, but presented in a way that you've never had it before, which is super cool. Um, this is another dish using the, the pea broth um, uh, as a water. It's really, it, it's delightful. It's a, it's a beautiful flavor. But you can also go a little crazy. This is French toast with pea butter um, going after it. I, the pea butter is so good, you, like, you want to put it on anything. Uh, anything becomes a vessel. The centrifuge is also great for cocktail applications. So this is, um, have you ever had uh, agua fresca, the, like, the Mexican very refreshing drink? I love agua fresca, but uh, because I'm a little OCD, I don't like the chunky fruit, you know, it gets stuck in the straw and, and you have the, the chunks. I don't like the chunks. Now, a sane person would just filter the fruit juice. Uh, but that's not me. I put the blended watermelon into the centrifuge to separate it out, and you get this very clear, thick watermelon juice, which is wonderful, especially when you add tequila and Tabasco sauce. Um, so, so these are, you could consider these semi-practical uh, applications of technology. Now I have some that are not so practical, but I think are kind of beautiful. I believe lasers are highly underutilized in cooking. So I'm, I made this dish. Um, what you see on the top there is a piece of nori, seaweed paper, uh, like you'd wrap around sushi, that's been cut with a laser, and it's sitting on top of a potato uh, in a consomme. Um, and the only reason to have it there is because I think it's beautiful. Um, similarly, I made a dish that I call butterfly shrimp. Um, <laughs> some more laser nori. Uh, and and uh, it's, I mean, it's a gorgeous medium, nori in particular, but having... A, you know, you couldn't cut this by hand. I certainly couldn't cut this by hand. Maybe, maybe there are people who could. Um, but I think it's a, a, a wonderful way to bring artistry to uh, presentation and cooking. And sometimes uh, with instructional value. So <laughs> there's how to use your chopsticks. Um, and this one I just thought was cool. This is two pieces of tuna sitting on a thing called spicy tuna. Now, I had this idea a couple years ago, and I did all these uh, trials, and I shopped it around to a sushi restaurant to see if anybody wanted to buy my laser-cut nori paper, and they all said no. And then, like, four weeks ago, I saw some companies producing laser-cut nori paper and won all these design awards and all this stuff, so good for them. Bravo to them. Um, again, not exactly practical, but... How many people uh, in like eighth grade science class did the electric pickle experiment? Anyone? This, it's not very safe, so maybe they faced it out. Um, so it turns out, it turns out that if you plug a pickle into a wall socket, kids, please do not do this. <laughs> um, it does neat stuff, and it, it looks like this. So what you're actually seeing here is, um, the, is an electric pickle. Uh, the electricity is exciting the sodium inside the pickle, and it causes it to glow, give off uh, visible light. It causes bacon to sizzle uh, as well. Um, and the amount of sodium uh, has a lot to do with how much uh, light it's going to give off and, and the reaction it's going to have. It turns out that even though bacon is highly salty, it doesn't have that much sodium. But you know what does have a lot of sodium? Soy sauce. 
Yeah. So for Halloween this year, if you want to put something out to scare the trick-or-treaters, a bowl of soy sauce uh, with two wires plugged into your household outlet. Again, please do not try this at home. Um, uh, some more non-practical experiments, but again, this is on the theme of things I think are cool. I tried to make oysters glow in the dark, and it didn't work. Um, often these experiments don't work out, but that's not the point. The point is to try. The point is to experiment. And if you're not failing, then you're not trying enough new stuff. I, um, there's a recipe in modernist cuisine for um, red oysters, which doesn't sound delicious, but they look super cool. You put oysters, live oysters, in beet juice, and they'll actually filter the beet juice, since oysters are filter feeders, and they'll hold on to that pigment, and you get oysters that have this beautiful red marbling. Well, I thought, okay, if that works, and if tonic water glows in the dark because it has quinine, what if, and by glow in the dark, I mean glow under black light, what if I put oysters in quinine-infused water? Maybe they would suck up the quinine and glow under black light. It didn't work. It turns out that quinine is highly toxic. Uh, in fact, to people in, in even marginal doses, it's pretty toxic. So I'm pretty sure I killed those oysters. Here was another idea. Uh, this was an article I did on how to make your own pink slime hamburger because it's been sweeping the nation in fast food joints. Um, uh, that the hamburger meat is actually raw ground beef and cream cheese that I put in the food processor. I did not taste it. Uh, but the article describes how you can treat it with ammonia if you have a cat box and uh, you can harvest the ammonia from your own cats. So keeping it all local. <coughs> this, is, uh, this is bean meat. Um, I, I uh, participated in this, uh, this other sort of exploration um, that took place in Norway. I didn't get to go, but I, I participated from here. That is examining the problem of non-meat meat sources. Um, since we're all supposed to eat less meat for our health, but also for the planet, um, the rate at which we're consuming animal protein is awfully high. Uh, so I made a fake steak out of two different types of beans. And you start by taking um, uh, red beans and, uh, and a white bean, like a chickpea or, gum or garbanzo bean will work, and you extrude them through a potato ricer, or if you've got a play school spaghetti factory, that'll work too. Um, and, th and then you form them into a patty, and the extrusion kind of gives the illusion of muscle. And you put a little fat around the outside, and that's how you end up with something that looks kind of like a steak. And then you rub soy sauce on the outside and give it a nice sear with some hash marks. And it's relatively convincing. I would actually, I'm, I love meat, and I would sit down and finish that off. It was pretty good. But then they pose this other question that says, okay, what about stem cell meat? What about in vitro meat? Uh, this will be a big part of our future um, eventually. Right now, though, the meat that's grown in, um, in Petri dishes, it's not a muscle. It doesn't come out as a muscle that you can like chop a piece off of. It's just a pile of cells. And so what do you do to market a pile of cells to get consumers interested in something? So I, I thought about this for a while. And I said, well, what meat most closely resembles just sort of a mush of cells? And it was sausages. It's kind of, it's homogenous. It's sort of mushy. And so what if you could have your own stem sausage kit where you buy porcine or bovine stem cell meat, and then we sell all of the flavorings that you need, and you put it in a mold, and you make your own sausage. This is just sort of thinking outside the box. I, I, I don't expect you guys to follow me here. <coughs> Another experiment that I've had ongoing for some time um, is the perfect temperature at which to consume Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Um, <laughs> and for the children in the audience, it's a beer. It's not a very good beer, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but it has a lot of uh, sentimental value, I suppose. Uh, and I've been searching for the ideal temperature to drink it. Uh, I have a chest freezer um, in our basement that came with the house. It's this old Kelvinator thing, and it it's got like 1950s styling and it, it looks super cool. And so I hooked it up to a very precise temperature controller so I could control the temperature down to 0.1 Celsius. And I found that about minus 8.5 Celsius is the perfect temperature to serve Pabst Blue Ribbon. When you open it, it gets slushy and it's wonderful. Uh, as an accident, um, I had a couple of small water bottles in the chest freezer. And I had heard about this phenomenon uh, where you can actually super cool water. So you can bring water below the freezing point under just the right conditions. And I happen to be lucky enough to catch these conditions on camera. This is real time, and there are no camera tricks involved in here. It's a regular bottle of water in a room temperature glass. 
and it freezes solid as soon as you pour it out. I'll play this once more so you guys can see it. Um, what's actually happened is the water in the bottle is below the freezing temperature of water. And there it goes, freezing right across. But as water freezes, it expands. And that expansion creates pressure inside the bottle. And that pressure depresses the freezing point of water. Once you open the bottle and release the pressure and pour it out, then it's able to freeze, which is super cool. I, I just I think it's neat. OK, so enough about me. Let me tell you a little bit about Modernist Cuisine. So I work for the company that made this. It's called Modernist Cuisine. It's five volume plus a kitchen manual book that um, is an encyclopedic treatment of cooking starting with fire up until maybe six months ago. Um, uh, and is pretty amazing. It weighs 50 pounds. Uh, and the retail or the list price is $625. You can probably find it on Amazon for $450. I highly encourage all of you to buy it, please. Um, it's the brainchild of this guy. This is my boss. Uh, his name is Nathan Mirvold. Um, he is a, he's got an incredible resume. He's, uh, he studied under Stephen Hawking, and he was the first CTO of Microsoft and founded the Microsoft Research Division. And his uh, teams have found more T. rex fossils than anybody else. And he funds SETI research. And one of the characters in Contact, the crazy guy in the space station, was actually modeled after him. And anyway, he loves cooking. And he had the idea to do this modernist cuisine project. So he built what we believe is the most advanced uh, research kitchen uh, in the world for doing this type of cooking. Um, and this is where I get to work, which is incredibly cool. We have one of everything and two of many things. Um, and in this book, he wanted to bring to life the science of cooking and what's actually happening as your food cooks, because it's really important to cooking better. Um, uh, you have to understand what's happening. If you don't understand, if you treat it sort of like a black box, um, you're never going to make uh, forward progress, or it'll be very slow and by accident. So they did things like this. They they did cutaway photos that illustrate what's happening. Now, th what this photo illustrates, a, a number of processes that are taking place, but it turns out that the flavor that you get from grilling comes from the fat that drips down to the coals and ignites back up. It is not from the flavor of the smoke of your charcoal briquettes, as it turns out, although lots of people will vehemently argue against that. Um, the experimental evidence shows otherwise. So, so this photo shows this process, and we literally did cut cookware in half. There's a machine shop uh, that's as part of our kitchen. Uh, ch this is a whipping siphon, as I was mentioning earlier. You can actually see the processes that are taking place. This is traditional pot roasting. Almost nobody does pot roast like this anymore, but this is how it works, and it shows the different processes that take place, the evaporation inside the pot and the condensation coming back down and boiling and desiccation and all this stuff. Um, this is a cutaway of broccoli that's being steamed. Uh, it turns out, uh, they did some experiments, in certain cases, boiling actually cooks faster than steaming, and they explain why in the book. But the original book was pretty expensive, and you need a lot of equipment to cook your way through all of it. So we just announced uh, two weeks ago Modernist Cuisine at Home, which will be hitting bookshelves October 8th. Um, and you'll be able to buy it on Amazon. Uh, the price will be about $100. It's 140 list price, but book pricing is a weird beast. Um, it's 456 pages plus a waterproof kitchen manual printed on washable paper. So you can take it into the kitchen, get it dirty, and rinse it off in the sink, which is wonderful. And it's got wonderful Americana recipes, mac and cheese, pizzas, hamburgers. And it's all stuff that you can do with equipment you probably already own or things that you could find at a, at a like a Sir La Table or William Sonoma. Nothing uh, beyond that. Um, and it's really a wonderful resource. This is our fake Martha Stewart kitchen that we built for this book. So this gives you a sense of uh, the breadth of tools that we're using. That, uh, that Viking oven we cut in half also. That was, that was pretty sweet. The, the standing rule at the lab is if somebody sends us two of something, we'll cut it in half. Um, here are, for example, some of the uh, grilled cheeses. And we, we tell you in the book um, how to take a great flavored cheese and give it the same melting properties as Velveeta, which is really wonderful. We've got things like chicken wings and um, uh, wonderful ice creams. Uh, so I highly encourage you to pre-order now. And I'm going to leave you with 
a beautiful video that I hope will play. It might not. Well, I'm just going to leave you then. <laughs> Thank you very much.